The global automotive circus, with all its spills, thrills, and artistry, has now reached its latest stop, Japan. Here at the 44th edition of the Tokyo Motor Show, car makers are showing off their visions of the future. Tokyo is well known for its focus on the particularly imaginative ideas, from the weird to the wonderful. Hailing from Asian manufacturers. The Tokyo Motor Show is an indicator for the Toyota's popularity in its own country. It might seem rather modest compared to bigger car shows in Europe, but you can see how many people come for Toyota. It's the biggest visitor draw here. Among the car makers' new developments is the FCV Plus, a fuel cell powered car that can also be used as a local energy source. The Kikai, on the other hand, is relieved of much of its bodywork to put its engineering on full display. Lexus is showing just how beautiful automotive design can be with the LFFC. The luxury concept car is more than a pretty face, however. It comes with a hydrogen fuel cell powering the rear wheels and electric hub motors on the front axle if all-wheel drive is required. The new Lexus RX 450h is out to challenge the likes of the BMW X5 and Audi Q7. It boasts 313 horsepower, delivered by a 3.5-liter V6 gasoline engine and two electric motors. It makes the dash to 100 kilometers per hour in 7.7 seconds. Nissan is showcasing the Teatro concept, one big mobile display screen. It seems like the entire interior consists of display panels to keep vehicle occupants visually entertained. The 2020 Vision Gran Turismo, meanwhile, makes the jump from console game to reality. The sports car study was developed for the PlayStation game Gran Turismo and is the big attraction at the Nissan stand. On the slick, rather than outlandish side, is Mazda's RX Vision concept. Its never-ending hood and cute little rear are more reminiscent of an Aston Martin. It also has flared wheel arches and a generally muscular form. But the surprise here is not only the design, but also the engines envisioned. The RX Vision is set to revive the rotary engine, which also powered the RX-8 with its high revs and turbine-like sound. Rotary engines have the advantage of being small and low weight and therefore fit nicely inside a wonderfully sculpted sports car body like this. European car makers are also making their presence felt in Tokyo. Mini is here with its latest convertible. It's bigger inside, promising more space for rear passengers in particular. The Mini concept has caught on across the world with customers in over 130 countries, including Japan. Japan has recently become extremely important for Mini, explains executive Peter Schwarzenbauer. They've been setting successive sales records for years now. Worldwide, the brand enjoys growth of 18 percent, in Japan, 25 percent. The new Mini models have been a big hit, which is why Mini decided to have a world premiere here at the Tokyo Motor Show. They figured it would also be a nice gesture to the many Mini fans here in Japan. BMW's new M4 GTS has made its international debut at the Tokyo Show, a real racing car. With 500 horsepower, it can reach over 300 kilometers an hour. The new water injection system provides more power for less fuel. It sprays water vapor to cool down the intake temperature in the twin turbo engine. VW is showcasing its new Tiguan GTE concept car. The compact SUV combines two worlds, having a gasoline engine working in tandem with an electric motor, as the VW passenger's car's chief explains. We have a plug-in version of the Tiguan here, he says. It will be launched on the market here next year. I think it will suit the market here very well, a highly attractive vehicle that I believe will see our sales grow in Japan. 
The concept car uses the same powertrain as the Passat GTE. It has a 1.4-liter gasoline engine and an electric motor, which together provide 218 horsepower. Porsche has brought its latest edition of the Macan. The new GTS version is inspired by motorsport, like all Porsche GTS models. It boasts 20 horsepower more than the Macan S. It has Porsche's active suspension management system and more powerful brakes, so sports fans can really let rip. With the XC90, Volvo has launched a new era. The second generation of the successful high-end SUV is the first vehicle in Volvo's new scalable product architecture, which is conceived as the basis for many future models. That offers advantages both in weight and design, and for development and production. The XC90 comes with five or seven seats. Our car tester Mata says it's not easy to put dynamic suspension in a car that weighs more than two tons, like the XC90. But the Swedish company has done a good job of it, he says, with no oversteering or understeering. The car responds to your steering better than in some compacts. Matas is testing the D5 version with its 165 kilowatt diesel engine and eight speed automatic transmission. The car shoots from zero to 100 in 7.8 seconds. Volvo says its average fuel consumption is 5.8 liters per 100 kilometers. The diesel engines of the new Drive E engine family all fulfill the Euro 6 emission norm. Every version of the new XC90 has a four cylinder engine, he says. The two-liter diesel engine in the D5 provides enough power and the car accelerates well. But Mata says there are situations when he wishes it was a bit more brawny. A new design feature is the T-shaped daytime running lights. And in the new generation, the front axle has moved further forward, extending the wheelbase, thereby increasing passenger space and enhancing driving stability. The long hood underscores the SUV's elegance. The new model makes a markedly more dynamic impression. That also goes for the side and rear view. The interior design has been revamped too. Our car tester says all Volvos used to have a freestanding central console. Here, that's been replaced by a 9-inch touchscreen that controls the whole multimedia system, including the GPS navigation, the radio, the telephone, and many vehicle functions. Another highlight in the interior is the completely digital instrument panel. The driver can select a color to fit his personal taste. The heating and air conditioning are controlled through the large central display as well. State-of-the-art infrared technology lets the monitor respond even before the driver actually touches it. The rear seats have their own climate zones. The XC90 also has a completely new runoff road protection designed to protect passengers if the car skids off the road. A lumbar support holds passengers in their seats and is also designed to prevent back injuries. But we're going off-road intentionally. Matas considers the air suspension a worthwhile investment for anyone who wants to take the XC90 into unpaved terrain. Switching the drive mode to off-road raises the undercarriage for increased ground clearance and also alters the engine setting. But Matas cautions against regarding the XC90 as a true off-road vehicle. It has no differential locks or off-road gear reduction.
On the plus side, when the forest closes in, the driver can take recourse to a system that was actually designed for parking and leaving parking spaces, the bird's eye view camera. Four little cameras around the car generate a 360 degree all around view. So when you're off road, you can see and drive around trees, branches and rocks. One of Volvo's primary development goals is safer driving, and so the Swedes have pushed forward their city safety accident avoidance system. It starts automatically, day or night, when you reach four kilometers an hour, recognizing vehicles, cyclists, pedestrians, and obstacles. That makes it one of the most advanced systems currently available. Mata sums up, the new Volvo XC90 is a great car with great equipment and great safety features, but he still thinks the engine could have a little more potency. The motor fehlt so das letzte bisschen Pfiff. People often underestimate the importance of stowing cargo safely, says car tester Reinhold Deisenhofer. Most people just pack everything in and drive off. But if they get into an accident, they could find themselves liable for serious money. Plus, wrongly stowed cargo can endanger the lives of passengers and driver. The rules are clear. Luggage must be secured sufficiently to withstand the centrifugal forces when driving round bends and remain secure in an emergency stop. Many think this only applies to professional truck drivers, says Reinhold, but in many countries the law applies equally to both private and commercial usage. So how can he stow cargo safely so that he's not posing a risk to anyone? The basic rules are... Always use a vehicle suitable for and capable of taking the cargo you want to transport. Items need to be distributed evenly, with heavier items at the bottom and lighter objects on top. And never overload your car. Consult your registration papers to find out the maximum overall weight allowed for your car. Plus, cargo must not obstruct your vision or access to the controls or exceed the prescribed dimensions. Under German law, if your cargo extends more than a meter over your rear lights, you have to attach a red warning sign to alert other road users. Very heavy items, 25 kilos or more, should be placed behind the driver's seat or in the footwell of the front passenger seat if empty, and then wedged so it can't move. In station wagons, a solid mesh screen divider, or the very least, a net should be set up between the cargo area and the passenger cell. The stability of the rear seats can be increased, incidentally, by attaching the seat belts diagonally. The most important thing is to secure the cargo. Lashing straps, load securing nets, and non-slip mats are very useful here. Smaller items or things that can't be packed evenly are best placed in a crate or box. Pay special attention to everyday lightweight items in your car. It's not things like drink crates that cause most injuries, but much smaller items like smartphones. Even at a moderate speed, the weight of the object is multiplied dozens of times over. In this case, that would be 16 kilos, which could be painful. But we don't just use space in our car for luggage. It's often a real dog's life for man's best friend when it comes to vacations. Around half of all dog owners take their canine friend on holiday with them, and on day-to-day -day excursions anyway. If your dog shows symptoms like restlessness, panting, or nausea, even on short journeys, then it might be prone to travel sickness. Dogs are as susceptible to the condition as humans are, but your vet can help.
You can get tablets from a vet like Bettina Oita. You need to give them to the dog shortly before you leave, and one dose is normally sufficient for both the journey there and back. If you're going on a longer trip, or you're on holiday and taking lots of day trips, then you have to give the dog a tablet each time, so that your dog is able to enjoy the holiday too. Dogs are sensitive to weather conditions, so try to avoid driving in the full midday sun. And never leave your pet alone in the car when it's baking hot. If you have a crash while traveling at 50 kilometers per hour, an animal in the car will go flying through the cabin with a force many times its own body weight. A 20 kilo dog would have an impact of half a ton. So for all dog owners, the question is not if, but how to secure their dog when driving. For smaller dogs, transport boxes are the most suitable option. They need to have a closable door and a non-slip mat underneath. Although boxes like this are relatively expensive and take up a lot of space in the trunk. The cheapest option is a special dog seat belt. They are available for every size of animal and can be attached to regular seat belts. But they must never be fastened to the dog's collar. Instead, you need a harness. Then there are partition grills. They're mostly adapted to a particular car model and use the fixtures already available in the car for optimum safety. They can be assembled easily without going to a workshop. If your dog is quite lively, a partition grill is better than a dog box as it offers more room to move, which is especially important on longer journeys. After nearly five years of production, Ford has given its successful C-Max minivan an extensive facelift. And what's under the hood has changed too. Particularly noticeable is the redesigned front. The big radiator grille with lots of chrome creates more presence. But the redrawn headlights seem more delicate than in the predecessor model. Also striking is the rising side contour of the C-Max. The rear lights have a large, clear, but somewhat arbitrary design. Ford has converted all its engines to fit the Euro 6 emission standard. Our test car is powered by the new 1.5 liter EcoBoost gasoline engine. Despite its modest capacity, the four cylinder engine produces 110 kilowatts and has a maximum torque of 240 Newton meters. Klaus Christoph Eicher from the German Auto Club ADAC says the engine is pleasantly quiet unless you rev it up too much, which you don't need to thanks to turbocharging. The C Max drives as you'd expect from a Ford, comfortable over long distances but still agile. Weight distribution in the C-Max isn't as good as it used to be, but in a slalom test, the car still avoids the traffic cones well with ESP interventions. And our test car can break from 100 kilometers an hour to a full stop in just 36 meters. Up to five people fit comfortably in the Ford C-Max. Even the rear seats have enough leg and headroom. The trunk boasts 460 liters of space, or 830 with the rear seats down. The instrument panel is easier to survey, and many functions are simpler to operate. Unfortunately, the rear view is somewhat obstructed by the broad C-pillars. At the German Auto Club's Eco Test Stand, the C-Max consumed an average of 6.4 liters of premium fuel over 100 kilometers. Ford rates the car at 6.1 liters, but the difference is negligible. The C-Max has a top speed of 204 kilometers an hour. Klaus Christoph Eicher from the German Auto Club says the Ford C-Max cuts a good figure with its fresh design, roomy interior and modern engines. Our test car with top equipment goes for at least 25,000 euros. 
Those who want even more room can go for the Grand C-Max. It has a longer wheelbase, room for seven people, and sliding doors. Back in the 1950s, Western Europe was in a post-war recovery boom. More people could now afford the nicer things in life. And in the automotive world, that meant exclusive coupes and convertibles. Carmen always specialized in open-top cars, explains our car reviewer Christoph. The Osnabrück-based coach maker turned out its first slick-looking convertibles and coupes in 1902 for all manner of car makers. But its moment of real glory came in 1955 with the Volkswagen Carmen Ghia, named after the coach maker that actually built it. And rightly so, because the car would never have materialized had it not been for Wilhelm Carmen Jr., company chief and son of its founder. In the early 1950s, he persuaded VW boss Heinrich Nordhof to put together a prototype. La Dolce, La Dolce Vita from Osnabrück, declares Kustav. The design of the Carmen Ghia was most unusual for a West German car in the 1950s. And it's no surprise to see an Italian behind it, Ghia head designer Luigi Segre. Wilhelm Carmen secretly asked him to put a beautiful metal shell onto a used Beetle chassis. In 1953, VW's hard-nosed boss, Heinrich Nordhoff, looked at the prototype and loved it. The Carmen Ghia went into production. The coupe got the undertaking rolling in 1955. This old advertisement shows workers polishing the Carmen by hand. The message was clear. The new Volkswagen promised exclusivity, elegance, and dynamic handling at an affordable price. The car was also marketed in the U.S. One of the most exhilarating cars in the world, the Carmen Ghia by Volkswagen. It may look like a sports car, but the Carmen Ghia was far from it. On its release in 1955, some journalists called it a parody of a fast car, which Christoph finds pretty mean. At the back, after all, it had the most powerful Beetle engine of its time. But the jokes failed to dent the Carmen Ghia's success anyway. Just two years later, in 1957, this beautiful convertible version hit the roads. That said, the Carmen Ghia's performance always trailed behind the promise of its dynamic appearance. Although good looks can get you a long way. Just look at those curves. It's as if the car were cast from one block of metal, and it is. The doors and hood are bolted on, but otherwise, all the body parts are welded together. That translates into high torsional stiffness. But on the other hand, every single repair job on this very rust-prone body requires a blowtorch. Many people consider the Carmen Ghia the best-looking Volkswagen of all time. The contours are perfection and a veritable delight for the eyes. And there's a range of other loving details that make the car a pleasure just to look at, let alone drive. The Carmen has 32 kilowatts of power and sprints to 100 kilometers per hour in a leisurely 23 seconds. <laughs> Top speed is 136 kilometers per hour. The Carmen Ghia convertible cost a good 3,000 Deutschmarks more than the technically comparable Export Beetle, but still became a bestseller. The convertible version alone sold over 80,000 units, the coupe over 360,000. The car was especially popular with the ladies, explains Christoph, earning it the naughty nickname Housewives Porsche. It is 20 kilometers per hour faster than the Beetle, thanks to its aerodynamics, but it's worlds away from a Porsche. A marriage of spectacular design and conventional production car engineering, the Carmen Ghia was the manifestation of an ingenious concept, one that Volkswagen and Porsche would further develop to acclaim with the 914 and 924 models. 
Carmen Dia deserves a lot of credit in Christoph's eyes. It was a breath of fresh air to West Germany's post-war streets, and the styling also opened up opportunities for other Italian designers in the German car industry. Without this car, we might never have seen the Bertoni BMW or the Golf designed by Giugiaro. And that's reason enough to call the Carmen Ghia a milestone in automotive history. The Carmen Ghia was in production for almost two decades, from 1955 to 1974. It was the first time automobile haute couture was available for the man on the street, too.